sort of officially get things started. Um, we are going to talk about writing goals and objectives this afternoon. And I, I think my main takeaway is sort of to understand that there is a difference between the two. My name is Tracy Miller, and I'm the Assistant Director in the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. And really, the best way to contact me is to um, use my email. So I made sure uh, I put that information um, on the screen for you. Uh, so I want to do some quick introductions. And I know some folks are still joining us. So I don't want to take a lot of time with each other. But just in the text chat area, if you could um, give your name, your department, or, or college, or maybe the program you're part of, um, and then a little bit about why you joined us today, just so we can le learn a little bit more about each other. My computer shows me that several people are typing, so that is great news. As you are typing, though, I'm going to kind of just talk a little bit about the workshop goals I have for today. Um, I am going to be covering learning domains, uh, course goals, so exactly what I mean by course goals, and learning objectives, of course, and why they're different. And then we'll actually practice um, kind of analyzing and writing some goals and objectives. Uh, so I can see some folks are introducing themselves, so that's great. If there's anybody that um, you want to respond to, feel free and just kind of dialogue with each other. But I see um, we have um, somebody from the art department, um, Kevin's from sociology, Bill's from music, uh, Laura is from also from sociology, so um, maybe you, you know Kevin. Uh, chemistry department, biology. So we have a really good diverse group today, um, but I think we're gonna we're gonna find our space and in, in our common um, ideas about goals and objectives today. And I like that we have so many different disciplines, and it's very important to what we're going to talk about first, which is um, learning domains. So there's many different types of learning. It's Some of it can be very cognitive, very um, critical thinking. Um, some of it may be more effective. Um, our feelings, our attitudes, our beliefs. And then some of it can be very much um, psychomotor, the, the um, skills and tasks that we need to do that we actually are moving our, our physical selves around with. So let's just unpack those a little bit more. So cognitive domain is um, content knowledge. It's a really the um, the student's ability to develop their intellectual skills, their thinking skills, uh, and, and how they sort of process information. Um, it often starts with recall or recognition of specific facts and concepts. So uh, I think if we, we have a chemistry, biology, you know, the, the sort of the uh, sciences like that really deal a lot with specific facts and concepts. So uh, those types of disciplines really uh, stay in that kind of cognitive domain in, in many ways. Um, but I think you'll find that they may kind of move out into some other areas too. So another really um, cognitive domain would be a, an accountant student. So I used sort of an example of what we might expect from our accounting students. And I've kind of peppered in a lot of examples throughout this uh, workshop today. So accounting students will prepare financial statements in accordance with appropriate standards. So that might be something that um, we set out that we want our students to be able to learn during our course. And so we're being really intentional about it as we write our goals and objectives. But it's not the only domain of learning. 
that I spoke a little bit about the effective domain and how um, it's a little bit a little bit softer maybe uh, definitely harder to kind of observe in your students but any sorts of feelings beliefs um, uh, you can see motivation attitude change those are sort of things that happen in that affective domain um, and like I said they can't be always seen directly so uh, they can be really hard to kind of uh, measure as faculty members um, even as subject matter experts we really know what we're looking for um, it may just be hard to articulate so for instance art students will value critique methods to improving their work by regular seek, regularly seeking feedback on products. And so how do we measure whether they value something or what may, whether they've increased their value for something? That can be difficult to do, but not impossible to do. So uh, we'll keep talking about how we can maybe um, measure our student success in that affective domain. So our last domain that we're going to talk about is the psychomotor domain. And that's really about motor skills, physical movement, uh, things which um, is in that kinesthetic realm uh, that we need to sort of uh, manually manipulate. And it's something that usually is developed through practice. And um, through the practice, you know, there's there's steadying levels of improvement and accuracy, and that's all through the the techniques and the procedures that we give to our students. So in this example, uh, music students will properly tune their musical instruments before pro, uh, performances. So uh, the the movement we're looking for is uh, tuning a musical instrument uh, and uh, specifically the appropriate time to do that would be uh, before performances. So I'm going to just take another quick look at my attendance. I'm always really careful about that because for the folks that need to uh, fill out service reports or um, they're going for the graduate teaching certificate, we, I want to make sure that my, my attendance is up to date. Still looking good. Gives me a chance to like pause for a moment too. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about goals first. And um, goals, you know, uh, the first thing I said about goals and learning objectives was there is a difference. And so I'm going to unpack goals a little bit, and then we can kind of talk about what those differences are. Okay, I had a little tickle in my throat, so I took a moment just to try to clear it a little there. Okay, so what do course goals do? Well, really course goals are, are what you sort of start with, and it will really help you to write course goals in order to provide you with direction, but this next one, focus, is so big. How do we really want to focus our work that we're going to do with the students throughout the course? Uh, you know, we don't want to kind of go off in these tangents, so we're going to start with like really focusing in on our goals for the course. They really articulate what we do and what our courses do, and by me, we, I mean us, uh, the um, faculty, instructors, teaching assistants, what those instructional bodies are going to be doing in a course. And then the, it can really help us um, set priorities for the course. And so, uh, again, it's, it's kind of kind of bring you back into we're going to really need to focus on those most important components are our goals for the course. To unpack it a little bit more, uh, a little bit of a difference, a comparison between course goals and learning objectives. Course goals are definitely broader and are more generalized statements, where learning objectives are more narrowly focused and they really um, are more specific. They're not sort of um, very grandiose and, and um, 
they are more precise as we sort of work our way down the list a little bit more, where a course goal would be more of a general intention we have for the course. Uh, course goals can definitely be more intangible. Uh, they're harder to kind of um, visualize, maybe. I mean, we can probably visualize them in our head, but they may be harder to visualize for, for our students. Um, where learning objectives are going to be more visible and more tangible, and the students are going to be have a, a much clearer understanding, a more concrete understanding, if we kind of bop down to the next one on the list, of what they are going to be able to do in this course. Um, course goals, I, it says cannot be validated. I'm going to say they don't really need to be validated. They're still kind of your, your hopes and dreams for the courses, um, but then those learning objectives really need to be validated or measured in some way or observable in some way. Um, so those are, that's, that I think is one of the most concrete differences between a goal and a learning objective is whether you can measure them, which the next one says difficult to measure, and a course goal and a learning objective, they should be easy to measure. When you're coming up with your course goals, you're going to focus on the big picture. How, how is this course really going to unfold? Where a learning objective will focus on the parts of a picture, so different elements, different components within the course. I promise you that is that was a very broad, generalized review of the difference between a goal and a learning objective. And uh, we're going to go over that, all of that in more detail. So here are some examples of course goals. And these are all written in different ways because they really do come from uh, different perspectives as a faculty or instructor comes up with um, a course goal. So students' perspective on civil rights will improve. Very generalized statement, um, definitely very difficult to measure, uh, but it begins to um, paint the picture of the course and what the course is all about and what the course, again, is, is going to be covering with the students. Um, you can go ahead and, and read these. I'm going to just pick out a couple of um, ones that I think have key points. Um, this one, my goal is to help you develop an understanding of and an appreciation of Shakespeare's plays. And so that really connects you with your students, too, because it's saying, here's my goal as the instructor. And here's my role as the instructor, because I'm going to help you, right? And then there's um, understanding of and an appreciation for. So that appreciation for um, can really get into that affective domain of learning. Um, but again, it's a goal. So it can be very difficult to measure. Um, and uh, it, it may be too sort of generalized in some ways. Um, let's see. In this course, I'm going down to the last one. In this course, you will learn skills for college success and lifelong learning. And that is a great outcome that you want for your students. Um, and I think it, it also shows a sense of how much you really care about your students, that you're, you really want them to be successful and not only be a student now, but in the future, but certainly it's hard to measure lifelong learning unless you're sitting side by side with your students in, for the rest of their life. <laughs> so you can see where these things uh, may be much more um, broad sweeping than um, the specificity that we're going to look for in learning objectives. So some tips. I always like to share some tips for writing course goals. Uh, when you begin, just brainstorm those concepts. Uh, I don't know how you sort of like to organize your brainstorms, but I like big, uh, big posters and uh, sticky notes and kind of just free um, jotting down ideas and then, you know, maybe uh, moving those things around. And so really give yourself that freedom when you start to write your goals. And then start to organize them and sort them by content area. So they have a, a sort of flow to them. And that's where I'm using those sticky notes. And um, I'm kind of moving them 
uh, around and sorting them according to content areas. Um, fine tune your final goals. Um, again, they're, they're probably going to be kind of sloppy and all over the place, but give yourself that time to really fine tune them. Um, use maybe a common language in them. Uh, you know, anything that you think that really will polish them off, go ahead and do that. I would say limit them to three to five goals. Uh, you know, that you can only accomplish so much in your course and your time with your students. And then finally, consider some non-content goals. So um, that may be something that really is um, outside of what you are trying to teach them, but it's still important. Maybe you want them be, to um, become a better writer, even if it's not a write in, writing intensive course. Maybe you want them to be able to network with each other. Um, so, you know, whatever it is, I'll think about those, um, those other goals that may not be um, as tightly connected to your content. Um, so I want to kind of wrap up goals with a little bit of a summary of what we just talked about, uh, kind of bring it all full circle for you. Um, goals really express your wishes and hopes. Um, it states what you do and what the course will do, not necessarily what your students will be doing. And we'll, we'll really talk about that uh, distinction soon. Um, and, you know, that's exactly what the next point is. is um, it's about the learning experience, but not about what they are able to do or what they are going to learn. Um, it creates a sense of purpose and meaning. Um, purpose and meaning is really important from a student-centered approach, where the students need to understand um, why what they are doing in this course is important, how it helps them be successful, and, and how it will help them be successful down the road. And then course goals really start that framework on how the course is going to look. So that's our brief synopsis of learning objectives. I'm kind of looking at my time. Uh, this is the first time I've done this workshop. So it's that's always fun, right? You know, you, if you ever think about some sort of um, lesson plan that you've come up with and you're wondering um, how your time is going to go, um, it, it, that's can always be refined in uh, future iterations that the first time is always an adventure. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about my time so far. So I want to make sure that I pause for a moment before we talk about learning objectives and um, offer up the text chat area for any questions that you may have. Okay, um, if you are typing something in, I will keep my eye on the text chat area, but I don't want to stretch this out. If no one has any questions, that's fine with me. Um, so my workshop objectives uh, that I was, I, I really um, became more specific with my workshop objectives than my workshop goals. Uh, what I hope you'll really get out of this workshop is the ability to recognize well-written learning objectives which are both measurable and include conditions, performance, and criterion. I hope you'll be able to describe the characteristics of a learning objective. Uh, I'm going to actually see that unfold when we do a practice activity. And then I hope you can compare learning goals to learning objectives. Uh, so those are my objectives for the entire workshop. So I hope you'll keep me honest and uh, make sure that um, you understand what the objectives are and how I can help you meet those objectives. So what is a learning objective? It's a description of a performance you want the students to be able to exhibit before you consider them competent. So what are the things that students are going to be able to do that you're going to be able to see 
through some sort of demonstration of the performance? And then um, what, at what level do you think that they're competent at this, um, this task or this performance? And then really learning objective is the intended result of your instruction rather than the instruction itself. Okay, so we're kind of moving um, from that, uh, what the course is going to do, what you are going to do into the course, to what the students are going to be able to do because of your instruction. So an uh, objective does not describe what you will be doing, but instead skills, knowledge, and attitudes of what your students are attempting to do and then they're going to do it with a higher degree of competency as you move through. Okay? Learning objectives are student-centered, and I mentioned student-centered earlier. It really does come from that student-centered approach to um, a learning experience. You're thinking of it from the student's perspective. Learning objectives should be written from the student's perspective. So you can start it off with something like, students will be able to when you're writing a learning objectives. Or even more directive and personalized, you will be able to. They definitely should be related to the course goals. They sh certainly shouldn't be in opposition to each other. Um, they should be written for intended outcomes. So your hopes and wishes and a goal. Um, you know, you do have that goal, you ha do have that outcome in mind, and so do the same for your learning objectives. Key deviation here, specific and measurable. No gray areas in a learning objective. You want to be really clear about um, what you want your students to be able to do, how they should do it, and to what degree you would like them to uh, do any of these activities. And then learning objectives really start the preparation of instruction. When you be, begin to design your, your course and your instruction for your course, um, your learning objectives are really your foundation for that. And then as they are the foundation, they also need to align with everything else that you're doing in the course. So I wanted you to take a moment to kind of take that in a little bit. So here's a different graphical representation about what I'm talking about, how everything needs to work together and align with each other. If things start off with your learning objectives, if those are your foundations, then that's a, a key component to how you put together your instruction in a course. And when we say, learning objectives should be specific and measurable. The way we're going to measure the student's success in meeting our learning objectives is through number two over here, assessments. Assessments, you know, are any graded assignments, any formative assessments, practice activities, or anything like that. That is what we are going, that's our yardstick we're going to measure our students against. And then anything else that really takes place in the course is number three over here, instructional activities, whether that's um, participating in class, um, reading the textbook, um, engaging in the content, all of those instructional activities all really need to work together in order to bring us to this sweet spot in the middle alignment when everything is working together. Um, before we kind of move into the next activity, I have a um, resource for you that I wanted to share. Let's see. I want to make, I'm going to add a link into the text chat area, and you can click on that link. What I'm sharing with you is a resource that was created 
by Iowa State University, their Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. And it's the Revised Bloom's Taxonomy. So there are some um, action verbs on um, how you can create awesome learning objectives. And one of the things that awesome learning objectives start with is um, really strong action verbs. And so uh, I like to pull out um, Bloom's Taxonomy, these resources. There's, there's a lot of resources um, on the internet on Bloom's Taxonomy. But I, I'll pull that out every single time I write learning objectives um, to give me some um, starting points on good action verbs. So let's talk about those a little bit. Um, again, I like to start from the student perspective. So I remind myself with this phrase, what students will be able to do, what you will be able to do in the course. Um, and I want to really avoid maybe some of these ambiguous fuzzy words. These are going to be ones that might um, be a little bit harder to measure. Um, some of the ones uh, in the top uh, may fit into that effective range a little bit. Uh, be aware of, can be really difficult to measure and I'm not even sure it's that strong um, but I think some of the key ones that uh, we can gravitate towards but we want to move ourselves away from is writing learning objectives with that start with the students will be able to know learn or understand um, it, it's easy to go to I know it is I've written learning objectives um, but it's so hard to measure whether someone has um, learned or now understand something. Um, but we know what it looks like. And so really, what does it look like and what is a better word for it? And it's probably going to be an action uh, verb or like we have here, some kind of performance word. And so students will adjust. Uh, one I really like is apply. Students will apply. Um, the use of a spreadsheet, you know, the, the, you can see that they're doing something. Apply has that real sense of doing something. Um, some of the um, ones that we would typically use might be identify our list. Uh, so you can get at different things. Um, you know, we, uh, we've got um, who is in, Lauren was in biology. So maybe you're identifying uh, the, the parts of the body. And so, you know, instead of saying students will know the parts of the body, say students will identify the parts of the body. And then it, it just becomes much more um, measurable that way. So hopefully everyone um, is not too in, in grossed in reading the revised Bloom's Taxonomy. I sent out in a link, uh, but it's a good resource. Keep that tab open um, and you can use it next time you're writing your learning objectives. So besides a action verb, uh, well-written learning objectives have three parts. Conditions, performance, which is going to align with that outcome you're looking for with your students, and a criterion, which is, to me, it's the degree of quality of their performance. And we'll unpack each of these in a little bit more detail. So conditions. Um, the conditions is, is really what's going to influence or impact uh, the student's performance in some way. Um, are there things that are assumed or given? Are there any kind of limitations? Um, but I think what it really all boils down to is this last piece, which is ask yourself, uh, as far as the performance goes, what do they have to do it with and to what? Um, and this will make a little bit more sense as we talk about these conditions a little bit more. Again, the effect performance. And in your mind, you're going to be asking yourself, with what and to what. So the first one, um, another person, is a to what. So if you are asking your students to literally do a performance, uh, in a piece of music, uh, delivering a speech, um, it, you know, 
dissecting a frog. I'm trying to think of the dis different disciplines that are in here. Um, do, do they need to do that in front of an audience? Do they need to do that to, with a partner? Um, any kind of those conditions um, should be stated in the learning objective. Um, the next one is tools and materials, but I think um, that really gets more specific when you talk about a pen or pencil or job aids. Um, do they need to do their chemistry calculations with a calculator? Or is this particular condition saying that they need to do these chemistry calculations without a calculator? So you're, again, you're developing your conditions in that level of specific specificity. Yeah, say that word three times fast. Um, another thing um, as we kind of unpack the conditions, um, I just kind of came up with some specific examples of how that might look. So uh, if I say students will discuss the unique characteristics of a sentence, using the electronic discussion board. I'm setting that condition by saying this is how they're going to demonstrate that through an electronic discussion board. Um, if they're going to deliver a speech that we just kind of alluded to, um, are they going to have to use deliver the speech using a PowerPoint presentation? Is that part of the condition that that we're establishing for them. So as I kind of go through these different characteristics of a learning objective, I'm going to kind of go through and expand it through this example of a balance beam. Um, so an example of the condition, when we talk about a student using a balance beam, we might say given a standard balance beam raised to a standard height. So we're very specifically saying that this is not a balance beam that's two inches off the ground. This is not a balance beam that we built with a two by four in the backyard. This is a, this is a real balance beam. So we're starting to set those conditions for our learning objectives. But let's jump into the performance because that's really what we're looking for with our students. It's going to describe the, um, what students are going to be able to do. And sometimes it's going to be very visible or auditory. It's just very, very obvious. In other ways, it's not as observable, but it may be something that um, you can determine um, through some sort of work that they're, they're going to be doing, um, whether it's part of a um, speech that might be a little bit more behind the scenes. It may not be as observable, um, but you really are, there's a balance. You're looking for both of those things. Um, it, it, you are definitely going to be doing something, um, or your students are going to be doing something, I should say. Um, and if you can really think about it being, being active in something that the students do, it, it really can help you write your learning objectives. Um, and then, of course, it, it's an intended action. It's not um, sort of an accident. I had someone ask me a couple weeks ago about, um, it was sort of like doing calculations for chemistry. And she said, well, of course, you have to do them accurately at that whole point. And I thought, well, you know what? If you don't say they have to accurately calculate this formula, then they could calculate it incorrectly and um, sort, of, sort of still meet the performance. And obviously, we wouldn't want them to do it incorrectly. But you know, it does show that intention that way. So here's some examples um, of what performance might look like um, from you know some various different disciplines. So um, students will be able to assemble a microscope. Okay, so that's going to be part of the learning objective. They're going to be able to compose a paragraph using three sentences. Uh, they're going to be able to solve a problem. Um, we talked about identifying. Uh, parts of the human body. This is even more discreet with label all the bones in the human hand. Um, and you can see there's something that students really need to be able to do. And you can observe it through their performance. Um, so if we kind of stretch out that example of a uh, the balance beam performance, 
um, in this example, it would be to walk the entire length of the balance beam. So we're not just, again, we've got the balance beam to standard height. It's a real balance beam. And we actually want them to walk the entire length of a balance beam, not just two steps. Uh, so let's talk about criterion. The degree, the accuracy, um, the speed that you want your students to be able to um, act out this um, objective. So it tells them when someone how much performance is required, how well the students must, must re perform the task. Um, really, it should be based on real world situations that shows a little bit more of the relevancy and the purpose of why they're doing these things. They, they can kind of connect those dots a little bit. And then it should definitely say something about the quality of the performance. Um, in these examples, uh, standards, principles, and conventions. Um, and we all have different standards and principles and conventions in our, our, our own discipline. And so we all have uh, the, those different uh, meter sticks of um, quality. And so we want to make sure that our learning objectives show those d degrees of quality. Um, and what we mean by they are, have, have been successful in uh, meeting those learning objectives and, and how they will be measured, basically. So let's talk a little bit more about criteria. Um, so it's going to help us know how we're going to test or assess the student's success and how successful really we were in our instruction. Um, students will know. Um, how their performance um, will meet our expectations or not, or, or what level they're at and what they need to do to get to the next level. And then it's also um, a basis for proving to students to do what you set them out to teach. So you're really, again, giving them that relevancy and that purpose, um, and you're connecting the dots for them. So you know, you're letting them know that um, this is why I'm teaching you this, and this is what you're going to be able to do. Okay, so let's talk about the three different sort of degrees or um, different types of criteria. Um, there's time and speed, accuracy, and quality. And we'll first talk a little bit about time and speed because that that does. You know, that is important to a lot of different objectives we have for our students. Um, I often get asked about um, responsiveness with students, and they need to be able to um, rapidly respond to something. Um, so you want to make sure that, OK, you need to be able to answer this question, um, demonstrate this um, within 15 minutes. Um, and th this kind of, um, you know, is it? Is it really soon? Is it a month? Uh, d does it have to be in the blink of an eye? You know that. Um, you're the um, subject matter experts. Um, but you also know what's the timing and the speed that st students need to be able to do it. So if we kind of expand even further with our balance beam example, we're saying that students will need to be able to span the um, balance, the entire balance beam within the six second time limit. Um, I think if I was on a balance beam and had to walk all the way across it at this point, um, I could maybe do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> but obviously, if we want our students to be proficient in this, um, you know, we're going to establish that six second um, time limit. So accuracy criteria refers to the performance and describes the proficiency you want them to be at. And maybe that's um, it, how far along they are in their program. Accuracy, proficiency may be gained over more time. It may be gained over time between the beginning of the course and the end of the course. And so you want to sort of set these accuracy um, tables for them to be able to say, you know, at this point, um, you might be at this degree, um, but by the end of the course, you're going to be even more 
proficient. And so what does that mean to you? And um, kind of letting your students know that. Um, so, th so this accuracy example with our balance beam is without falling off. So um, again, with my 10 minute across the balance beam, I think I might fall off a couple times too there. So I probably wouldn't meet um, these criterion for this particular learning objective. Um, quality is another one. So you, you want to describe um, any sort of quality indicator uh, that makes sense to this learning objective. Um, I think if, because we um, haven't talked about it a lot, um, you know, is there a certain percentage that's considered quality of any sort of learning objective? Um, is it eight out of 10 standards that the, the students um, meet? Is it um, scoring a 90% um, of the criteria and you come up with their, for their grade? Um, you know, is it 70% of the criteria? You know, where should they be at? Where are they going to fall out? I always feel like criterion is really where um, you start to work on um, rubrics for your students that you're going to craft in order to be able to measure, again, their achievement of the learning objectives. So let's pull this balance beam um, activity all together. So in a goal, we're thinking, you know what? I really want my students to be able to walk the length of a balance beam. When we look at it from all those components of a learning objective, I'm going to say given a standard balance beam raised to a standard height, the student dressed in a standard balance beam usage attire, that might be overkill, will be able to walk the entire length of a balance beam from one end to the other steadily without falling off in within a six second time span. So um, again, this, this might be a little much, but it may not. I mean, this really lets the students know um, what you're expecting out of them and what you're going to measure them against. Um, in this example, the condition was giving a standard balance beam raised to a standard height. So that's the condition we've set for our students. Um, and that is what they should um, maybe practice with the same condition. Their performance is going to be walking the entire length of a balance beam. We're, that's very observable. We can definitely see the students doing that. And then how are we going to measure the quality of their performance? And that's because they're going to steadily, without falling off, and within a six seconds um, time span. So that's how the three types of components fit together. Um, but why should we care about? This is a lot of work. Why should we care about it? Um, it's really going to help you in your instruction. It's going to help you select the appropriate um, media and materials. It's going to help you with your lectures and your course time um, because it's, again, going to really focus you. Um, any sort of activities that you put together are all going to be based off of the, your goals and objectives for the, the course. It's going to help you set your expectations for the course. And then your students are really going to be able to meet your expectations because they have that clear picture of, of how it all is going to work together. Um, and you're going to know by the end of the course that the students have really have they met most of your goals and your objectives you're going to you're going to kind of see the the results of that at the the end and you're going to be able to measure your own instruction based off of the results that you're seeing from the students um, so i've got some tips for writing learning objectives again pull out that bloom's taxonomy um, and start with good, measurable, observable action verbs. Um, build upon existing objectives. You don't have to start from scratch. Look at your own learning objectives. See they, a couple of things that I noticed that, you know, they'll either be written from that, what we're going to cover in, co in class instead of um, what the students will be able to do. So you can kind of flip those around a little bit. The other thing I've seen is the, the learning objectives that we'll start with. Um, learn, know, or understand 
again, you're still going to pull out that Bloom's taxonomy. How do you know in your head that a student now understands something? What is happening when that light bulb goes off? Use those um, action verbs. Start your learning objectives with those. Um, and, you know, just make sure, again, that they're measurable, that somehow you can also quantifiable down here on the bottom, that somehow you can not only measure them, but measure their degree of quality in some ways. Um, again, I, I just, I can't stop with learning objectives before I go right into um, writing up that rubric, because that just sort of seems to go really well together. I want to make sure that in the last 10 minutes, we have some time to practice um, sort of dissecting some learning objectives. But I want to make sure that we um, mentally pause a little bit to just summarize what we've gone over. Um, our goals are our broad statements. Objectives are more specific and measurable. And they're really going to guide our students. Um, when you think about these, think about those uh, those conditions are constraints that students might have, even though it seems like a little bit of overkill and a little bit of um, a little bit of silly. Um, you know, it it's important to think about those again, so everybody has a really clear vision um, about what's going to happen in the course. And then, what do you, do you want students to be able to do? And then, how well must a student perform it for you to be satisfied? Um, and you know, I think we've got a couple of the um, aesthetic folks in here with art, music, and and we know the degree of performance that needs to happen in order for us to be um, satisfied. Um, we're just kind of articulating it a little bit more. All right, so we're going to do a little whiteboard practice because um, we're going to do some interactive activities. And so I've got a screenshot up here for you. And we're going to just play around a little bit. So if you go to the top of your screen, you should see this T. If you click on that, that's a text box. And basically what you can do is just click somewhere on the screen and start using the whiteboard. The whiteboard is just the screen right in front of you. So you can um, type your name. I can see some highs. I can see some hellos and smiley faces. Every, everyone's using a blue pen. Just so you know, you can use the dot at the top. That will let you change your color. Happy Valentine's Day. Someone's already figured it out. Awesome job. OK, another thing you can use is uh, the shape at the top. Y you can see there's a couple different shapes to choose from. Um, basically, a rectangle, a circle, or a line. So you can try that out a little bit. Again, you can change your colors. We're not going to practice too much more, but you can see there's, there's also a, a pencil at the top there. So if you want to try a little bit of um, mouse freehand writing, you can do that. <laughs> Somebody found the eraser. <laughs> All right, excellent. Oh, you know what? Everyone's uh, curvy lines look pretty good. All right, so I'm going to put some learning objectives up there. And we're going to underline, circle, do a box around um, different parts of the learning objective. So first, I want to know, in this example, what is the condition? So you can read the learning objective in front of you. And again, circle, underline. Draw a box around where you think, OK. In the classroom, using prepared materials. Oh my gosh, there's so many of them up there that it's like all crossed out. <laughs> Good job, though. Let's see. In the classroom, using previously prepared materials. So we're really saying that the student is not doing an oral presentation in their backyard or at home or um, I don't know, in, in the center of the 
library, you know. <laughs> Our condition is in the classroom using previously prepared materials. So let's go to the next one. What is the performance then? What are we going to observe and measure the student's performance of? And again, you can underline, circle, box, nice. OK. All right, very good job. See, I have a lot of confidence that I am meeting my workshop objectives at this point because I can observe it happening. Um, so you're right, present an oral presentation or dramatic presentation. I, I love that there, there's a potential for a dramatic presentation of some criterion. So what do we think the criterion is for this learning objective? Accuracy is definitely some criterion, right? That That is the degree that we are looking for. Um, just to expand it out a little bit more um, to maybe um, a more specificity, um, a mathematical concept, groups of five, which is what I, I think is hilarious, that you can do a dramatic presentation of a mathematical concept. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done. I used to work at the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, and I've seen some pretty dramatic mathematical concept mapping. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. So what is the condition for this learning objective? Okay, excellent. You can see there's a, there's a definite formula to this, right? So we're the, it can start with the condition that we're looking for. How about the performance? Yes, we're doing the action verb at the, the beginning. It's observable. We're talking about a paragraph. We're not writing a discussion post or a uh, text message, right? Awesome. How about the criterion? I love that you're getting creative with your annotations. Excellent job. So I don't, I don't want to make it too easy on you, though, because I did say that there is a formula to it. But think about that formula when you're writing them yourselves. You know that there's, there's that condition, performance, and criteria. So um, fuzzy objectives might be better as goals, um, just to hone in on that comparison a little bit more. Um, I, I'm saying in this one, you will understand how to develop a nutrient management plan. And so that's a, it's a very good course goal. Um, we have talked about course learning objectives. There might be even more specific, more distinct or discrete learning objectives at a module level, at a class level, at a, a week level. And so I like this one because it says at the end of this module, you will be able to list the seven steps required for CDR in developing a nutrient management plan. So, you know, the, the condition even is at the end of this module because that's a time condition. Um, and in this case, the performance will be listing seven steps required by CDR. And then um, you'll be doing that through developing a management plan. So that's a little bit of your, your criteria. You're going to measure it against um, a management plan that probably um, works in with maybe um, a larger project of um, developing a, a, a more mature plan, perhaps. I don't particularly know this, um, this discipline, so it's hard for me to sort of imagine how this works out. But um, Really, this, these examples, you know, gravitate towards the one that maybe speaks to you a little bit more. Um, but you know, they all can. You can take those sort of fuzzy objectives that you may have now and try to make some more effective, well-written objectives using the formula that we've 
um, gone over today. Um, so again, I just I want to make sure that we just really are clear about the difference between a goal and an objective. And the goals are about um, what um, you hope to accomplish, um, but necess not necessarily um, the result of products that are observable, measurable. Um, the learning objectives are a lot more about what students will be able to do, what you can observe and measure um, after you complete your objectives. So we are at 1259. Um, I will certainly be happy to hang out for a few minutes um, to answer questions. Um, thank you, Megan.